Nerd sniping is the process of posing a question that's so intriguing to a nerd that they drop everything else and can't stop thinking about it until they get an answer. Hi, I'm Josh, I'm a nerd, and I was recently sniped. But I've got to admit, I was already in a relatively vulnerable, vulnerable state. Um, I've been thinking about this HD analog video synth, modular video synth for a while, and sort of picturing a wall, a cabinet with potentially hundreds of connectors on them. And I've been asking the question, what's the right connector to use for a modular video synth? And um, I've been sort of casually sort of looking in spare time on DigiKey, and there's tens of thousands of connectors that are probably reasonable enough for the job. But how do I pick the right one? I've been looking at data sheets, um, chatting on forums, and recently someone posted a question on Reddit in response to a question I was asking, saying, why not just use an RCA connector? After all, don't you remember? That's what they use for component video. But yeah, why not just use RCA? And that sort of spiraled me off into the deep end of um, thinking about what sort of connector to use. And that led me to build this. This is probably, um, in terms of most expensive versus least function boards I've ever built, this is probably the one. Um, there are some pretty expensive connectors on here. And today we're gonna do a shootout, working out which connector I should use for my HD uh, modular video synth. So let's run through each of the criteria. Um, but I guess before I do, let's talk about the connectors that I've chosen. So up the top here, I have Old Faithful. I have a BNC connector. Then down here, I have the mini cousin or one of the mini cousins of BNC. I've chosen the HD BNC connector. Then we have the DIN 1.0-2.3. Then an SMB connector, which comes from sort of the RF world. Then RCA. And down here, we have some other um, components that I included to make sure I could calibrate this impedance controlled board so that my reference plane was just behind the connector. I'll get to that later. Um, so basically shooting off one, two, three, four, five different connectors. So what are my criteria? I came up with a list of criteria. This is fundamentally an engineering problem. Um, there is no ideal connector designed exactly for what I want. Um, so I've got to define what I'm looking for. First up, we have bandwidth. Bandwidth um, is probably the one that I spent most of the time in the deep rabbit hole on. Um, all these sort of modern connectors here are designed for sort of this, uh, all of these are primarily used for uh, high speed RF signals, microwave signals, um, SDI video signals, um, which all operate north of uh, sort of three gigahertz. So we have plenty of bandwidth, but, but how do we know that that's plenty? Let's sort of set the stage. Um, NTSC PAL sort of SD video is south of 10 megahertz of analog bandwidth. The carrier frequency for the color burst signal in NTSC and PAL sort of in the four to six megahertz range. Um, basically DC as far as RF engineering is concerned. I am not an RF engineer, but I hear that's a thing that they say. Um, uh, so what sort of bandwidth do we need if we want to go to HD? Well, let's look at 1080p 60 video. That's the highest uh, sort of pixel clock uh, supported by uh, component video, at least officially. Uh, that has a pixel clock of 145 megahertz. So does that mean you need 145 megahertz of bandwidth? Well, no. Um, Nyquist theorem basically says that if you want to reconstruct a signal with frequency X, you need to sample that frequency, uh, sample that signal at a frequency of 2X. Um, and that would then create sort of the sine wave, the highest frequency sine wave component that would be of value X. So if you had 145 megahertz uh, analog sine wave that you wanted to create, uh, wanted to reproduce, you'd need to sample that at 290 uh, megahertz. Is 290 megahertz enough? Well, not really. Um, think about the situation where you have a black pixel followed by a white pixel followed black, white, black, white. That would basically look like a square wave happening at 145 megahertz. Um, yes, sampling at 290 megahertz would let you create a sine wave with that frequency, but when you start thinking about the way an analog to digital converter works, when it locks onto the signal, charges up a capacitor, reads the value out, um, you need to basically try and get that square wave to be as high for the entire period of, of, of its duty cycle. Because um, if you just fill it with a sine wave, um, the average value of that will be much lower. So you'll effectively have created a low pass filter. You'll be recording uh, high frequency values at a, at a lower value. Um, so you start to think about what is the rise time and, and, and fall time of that square wave that you want to support. And when you start doing a little bit of the math um, at 1080p, uh, 60 frames a second, you're sort of looking at four or 500 megahertz of analog bandwidth is what you need. 
Um, now, while it's not technically supported, if you wanted to do 4K um, over analog space, you'd be looking at 500 megahertz times four, so two gigahertz uh, of bandwidth. Now, there's lots of really good reasons why you don't want to be doing video, um, 4K video in the analog domain, but I've never let good reasons get in my way before. It's a fun sort of challenge. So, um, two gigahertz is, is, is probably stretching it. Like, you know, if you get a little bit of smearing, a little bit of high frequency loss of black white pixel going on and off in a 4K video, that's probably okay. But let's set that as sort of our upper range. Now, as I said, all of these connectors here are rated to over uh, two gigahertz. These are four up to 12 gigahertz. Um, so they should be fine. Um, what's also important when you're looking at high bandwidth signals is impedance matching. Now this is a deep, deep rabbit hole. Um, video signals are typically sent over 75 megahertz. A lot of the RF connectors, like, like these guys down here, uh, these are typically 50 uh, ohm connectors. You can find 75 ohm variants of them. These are all 75 ohm connectors. RCA doesn't specify um, what, 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 what impedance it is. Um, impedance matching is important because um, typically what you'll see in, in, a, in any sort of uh, system, a passive system, is you'll get support up to that bandwidth and then things will drop off. In fact, bandwidth, analog bandwidth is defined um, as the maximum frequency where you have less than three decibels of loss. Um, so you get a sort of a curve that's flat in the passband range and then just sort of drops off um, to th minus three and then off to you know, minus infinity decibels. Um, where does that energy go? Um, there's definitely some resistive effects. You, you lose uh, some of that power um, based on the cable type that you've chosen uh, or, uh, in, into heat effectively. But if you don't have perfect impedance matching, um, a lot of that signal or some of that signal will reflect back into whatever is trying to send it out. And you actually start losing a lot of your signal from reflectance rather than just uh, the transmission losses. Um, so I wanted to, to measure the bandwidth of all of these. And the way that I did that is by setting up this controlled impedance board and then making a custom cable with a known um, cable in it. Let me grab some of them. So I made a variety of these uh, cables with RG179 75 ohm coax. Um, these are all the same length and I've connected each of the connectors on the end here. Um, by having the exact same cable and the same length of cable, you eliminate that from the comparison. Like if you just bought an off-the-shelf, like this RCA connector looks kind of weird, but if you bought just an off-the-shelf RCA connector with a random cable in it, is it the connector or is it the cable? All right, this is the results that we've all been looking for. Um, this is a logarithmic plot of frequency um, on the x-axis and decibels S21, which is basically there's a de decibel through the cable. Um, of the five different connectors. The red line that you see is the minus three dB cutoff point. And you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of lines that are grouped up the top that are basically flat all the way up to 200 megahertz. That's the HDBNC, DIN, SMB connector. Um, the reason why you're not seeing the RCAs, I sort of, I think for this chart here, I use the RCA as the through reference. That probably also explains why the other three good connectors uh, all sort of wiggle in the same way. They've just been calibrated to the wiggles that are in that um, BNC cable. Um, but they're, they're all fine all the way up to two gigahertz. Um, the outlier is the line that you see at the bottom. That is our good old friend, the RCA cable. And this is an RCA cable that's metal shielded using RG179s, the same as the other cables. Um, same length as all the other cables. It's quite a short RCA cable. It's, it's I think I can't remember the exact length, um, but it's under a foot. And it has a 3 dB cutoff around, let's call that 70 megahertz. Performs pretty good up to 20 megahertz. So yeah, fine composite video will be great uh, in that environment. You'll notice that the chart only starts at 10 megahertz. Below 10 megahertz, you'll, you see some difference between the RCA and the others, um, but they're all acceptable. Um, but once you start getting above 100 megahertz, the RCA goes to shit, I think is the technical term. So that's bandwidth. The second criteria that I had is really on panel mount. Uh, panel mount connectors, I don't know if you can see these guys here, uh, but the HD, BNC, DIN connector, and you can get BNC ones as well, I just haven't used it here. These can be panel mounted. That means that they can be mechanically attached to the panel which means that any forces of engaging and disengaging the plug are transmitted to the metal panel or the front panel 
rather than the PCB. You don't want to be using your PCB as, as sort of a structural component. I mean, it's okay, but it means you're putting forces through to the solder joint and the PCB. You can get fractures and you can break things pretty easily. Like if you knock something on accident, you don't want to snap a PCB in half. So panel mount was important for me. Panel mount was also important because um, like this SMB connector down here, you, you can't really find them in panel mount varieties. And that kind of rules it out because if you wanted to have say a potentiometer on the front here or a button, um, you don't want to have a recess in your front panel where you have to sort of reach in while your potentiometer knob is you know, up higher on the circuit board. So you want to be able to sort of keep the, the, the panel mount connections um, higher than any other component that you have so they can all be flush on the front panel. Uh, what else was important? Uh, force. That was another mechanical uh, question. Um, how much force does it take to sort of engage and disengage with a B and C connector? It's uh, relatively easy to connect and disconnect. You have this bayonet locking mechanism. That means once it's connected, it, it, it's, it's hard to yank that out. You'd break the board before you got this guy out. HD, B and C, same sort of deal, but smaller. Where's my HD, B and C? That feels really nice. The one that feels the best in my book is this DIN connector. You cannot, this is not feel a vision, but DIN sort of connects on. It has, I think, 60 newtons of retention force, which is quite a fair bit. But if you just grab the outer shield, it pulls back a little latch and into a detent. And so it's a push-pull connector. So you get the benefit of uh, locking without having that bayonet mechanism. It's just a push-pull to get it on and off. Now, SMB was sort of um, definitely not a traditional connector for, for this use case. Uh, and I looked at it online and I thought, oh wow, these are really popularly made. They're a lot cheaper than the other variants, at least in high quality ones. Um, but what I didn't realize from the data sheets is they're quite easy to get on. They don't have a detent mechanism, but there's some yanking involved to get them on and off. Then RCA, this is a, this is a, you know, a good brand RCA metal can, case that's so shielded. Um, the, I don't know if you can see, I'm probably out of focus but this has slits on the outer circumference and the fins are folded in. So it grips pretty tight on and tight off, but most sort of off the shelf RCA connections are pretty loosey goosey. Um, so we've talked about uh, a bunch of things. Another con constraint for me or consideration for me was diameter. Now B and C and RCA, they physically take up a lot of space on the board. Um, that's not the only problem is board space. I wanna get these to be relatively high density, but board space isn't the only constraint. With a BNC connector, you sort of have to pinch your fingers in like this and grab it to be able to get it and then do the twisting mechanism. I've definitely designed boards where I've put the BNC connectors too close to each other and it's hard to get your fingers in between to uh, connect them. Same sort of thing happens with a BNC, the HD BNC connector, but you can sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a smaller plug, so the, the effect is smaller. DIN is probably the best pushes on very easy, and your fingers are parallel when you're pulling them out. Now you can definitely pack these guys a lot closer, and these ones as well, um, because these are used professionally in you know, uh, SDI patch panels and things like that. They can pack them a lot closer than what your fingers can fit, and there are tools you can get to extract and insert them. I didn't wanna go for a tool. Um, I wanted just to be able to do it with your finger, so I'm not gonna be packing them in super tight, but uh, I really like this, 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 this DIN connector. It just feels nice. SMB, same sort of feel as the DIN, but as I said, more yanking. Um, what's the other concern? I think the last one on my list is durability, or second to last one on my list is durability. Now, RCA connectors probably actually win out here. If you look at the data sheets of all of these, they, um, good connectors will provide the number of mating cycles that they're rated to. The RCA connector, this one um, on its data sheet, it says it's rated to like, I think 10,000 cycles. Um, maybe even 100,000 cycles. All of these other ones are sort of 500 plus cycles. That's connections and disconnections. And so you'd think, you'd think RCA would be the absolute winner. Um, what I've been trying to work out is the failure modes of these other connectors, and I have not done 500 cycles myself. My suspicion is that they probably won't keep to their mechanical um, specifications in that they might become a little loose over time, like this SMB connector will probably, because it's just a forced detent, that detent will become loose over time. Um, and maybe they don't keep their sort of, you know, if they're rated to nine gigahertz, it may not keep its nine gigahertz rating. 
what I have seen with um, you know some people posting on forums is that these have very fine pins inside them. The SMB, HDBNC, and I think the DIN was the, the sort of the finest pin that's in there. If that pin is not perfectly aligned to the center hole, when you push it in, the pin can retract back um, in the connector. It can get bent. Um, so you can imagine there are a variety of different failure modes. Um, but because of the way that these, these guys are designed, it's more likely, I believe, for the cable to fail. Um, and that's, you know, <clears throat> easily replaceable rather than the connector, uh, sorry, the jack on the board. So durability is important. I think these guys, even though they're not rated to number, the same number of mating cycles as this guy, they're, they're well built. Um, I think they'll last. Finally, cost. As I said, this is one of my most expensive boards and I may not have an advanced degree in quantitative finance, uh, but at $20 a pop just for the uh, jack, um, where's my chroma keyboard? That would be $200 of connectors on this board alone. Um, so cost is an important component in thinking about this. Uh, these uh, BNC connectors are about $350. These are about $15. These are around $18. These SMB connectors $3. I think these were $1.50. Um, that's just the jack. Uh, the plugs for these were about three bucks as well, so it meant that the total unit was around, uh, for a plug and a jack, is around six bucks. The total unit for an HDBNC plug and jack is $30, $30, $15 for the SMB, and like five bucks maybe, like using quite expensive RCA connectors for the RCA connector. So winner, second, third and fourth and fifth. So um, what I've since discovered is that there's um, DigiKey prices and then there's specialty seller of RF connector prices, which are often half as much for the same name brands. And then there's probably half again or maybe more if you don't buy an Amphenol or a King's or a sort of a name brand and you go to Alibaba. You can buy these for like a buck fifty versus the sort of twenty bucks ish that you'd be paying on DigiKey. Um, so prices all over the shop. These are all DigiKey prices. I figured that's you know an apples to apples comparison, um, but there's probably savings to be made by by going elsewhere. I am leaning. This is the great reveal towards a DIN connector. DIN 1.0-2.3. That's what I'm going with. Um, it's a sexy connector. I think I did all of this to um, really answer my, my pre-assumed aesthetic choice that RCA is just de A and, and DIN connectors just feel right. They feel sexy, they perform well. Expensive, um, but they do the job very, very nicely. All right, this has been a much longer video than I thought it would be. Um, hopefully it was enjoyable. Hopefully you maybe learned something. Um, maybe you'll chime in on the comments and teach me something because there's a lot for me to learn in this. And I've got to say, I do not love crimping uh, tiny things. I have lost those little pins and the little dielectric spaces and my carpet's probably covered in them. But this has been a fun experiment. I have been nerd sniped into oblivion, maybe. Um, I've gone off the deep end. Uh, but I learned some stuff and uh, yeah, anyway, see you in the next one. Bye.